I welcome you all to the lecture number 16, uh, which is titled as Emotion and Memory. And uh, this is under module 7, and module 7 is talking about emotions and cognitions. So, in this module, we are talk looking into how emotions and cognitions interact with each other. So, this module has three lectures. One lecture we have already covered, uh, which is uh, we have given an introduction to the concept of or interaction of emotion and cognition. Today, we will be talking about how emotion influences our memory. So, before we talk about a little bit of brief recap of what we have discussed in the last lecture. So, last lecture was more of introduction in terms of understanding uh, how cognitions influences emotions and more specifically we have discussed how emotion influences cognitions. So, we have discussed the various ways in which uh, both can interact with each other. More specifically, we have discussed what are the different th perspectives through which we can explain the impact of emotion on cognitions. So, in that context, we have discussed three theoretical perspectives which can explain the effect of emotions on cognitions. The first one was the concept of emotion congruence or mood congruence also people say, which basically talks about that our present mood or emotion influences the diverse cognitions such as what we attend, how, what we perceive, what we remember and how we process the information. Whatever emotional mood we are in the present time, that will influence the varieties of cognitive processes, including our perception, attention, memory and decision making and so on. So, that is broadly called as the um, mood congruence or emotion congruence. So, we have discussed the various theoretical perspectives which can explain this. One was Bauer associative network theory. We have also talked about effect infusion model to explain how emotion or mood congruence can be explained. The second perspectives that we have uh, discussed uh, in terms of understanding how emotion influences cognition is, is the concept of feeling as information or emotion as information. So, this perspective basically talks about that emotions or feelings basically they, uh, they kind of serve as a signal or an information about our surroundings or the situation which we are in. So, it gives an information and this information help us to take decisions. For example, if you are afraid or fearful, that means it is giving a signal that something is dangerous in the environment or the situation. And accordingly, we take decisions and uh, you know, uh, take actions. So, that is the idea of feeling as information. So, we have discussed the diverse aspects uh, around it. And the third perspective that we have discussed is called style of processing. So, different ways we process information. Uh, in that context, we have discussed the system 1 and system 2 of cognitive processing, which basically means sometimes we uh, take decisions or process information very fast, which is called heuristic processing. And sometimes we elaborately discuss, we elaborately understand pros and cons and different aspects, uh, which is which is basically elaborate processing, you know, which is called system 2 also. Uh, so, basically emotions can influence some, some emotion can uh, influence in terms of processing of heuristic processing. Some emotion facilitate heuristic processing. On the other hand, some emotion can facilitate kind of more elaborate uh, detailed processing. For example, most of the positive emotions uh, have, have been found to uh, facilitate heuristic processing. Uh, emotions such as an, uh, anxiety, anxiety or sadness have been found to kind of facilitate more elaborate processing. So, uh, then we have also discussed about how emotion influences our attention and perception in more detail. So, these are the some of the things that we have discussed in the last class. Uh, mostly, we gave an introduction uh, to how the various ways emotion can influence cognitions. In the today's lecture, we will be specifically more specifically looking at connection between emotion and memory. So, we will be not, not talking about all the other aspects of cognition, but more specifically memory functioning we will be looking at and how it is impacted by the emotions. So, uh, in today's lecture, we will be focusing some of the, uh, these concepts like emotion and memory we will be talking about. We will be talking about mood congruent memory, we will be talking about mood state dependent memory and at the end we will be talking about eyewitness memory. And in all this, how emotion comes into the picture, picture we will be kind of looking into that. So, let us start today's lecture. So, when we uh, talk about memory, memory has three important processes. One is encoding, 
one is then storing and then retrieval of information. So, memory includes encoding, storing and retrieval which kind of you know kind of SQL share processing happens. So, this is this can be kind of explained like this. So, there is an encoding then after encoding things get processed in an, and it is stored. storage after storage it is retrieved so these are the three main aspects of memory so we encode where we basically get or kind of take information in the memory system so just feed the information from our sense organs whatever we see whatever we hear whatever we process all this information kind of kind of through encoding we it gets in, into the memory system. Uh, so, this getting information into memory is like encoding then you store the information somewhere uh, in terms of or whatever information that we encoded you, we, we kind of store it either for short term or for long term then whenever required later we retrieve them from our memory system. So, if you, if you kind of compare this with our computer system for example, through keyboard we kind of encode, we kind of give information to the uh, computer system through keyboard certain information. So, that is encoding then this information are stored in the uh, computer systems more like you know like uh, you know whatever hard drives and other things are there. Where, where all the information that are feeded are kind of stored and then retrieved in the let us say monitor. So, it is very similar to uh, this kind of system where our all the informations are encoded then they are stored and retrieval. So, this is a kind of sequential processing this goes on. Now, a lot of research says that when you talk about human memory system in computer things are stored exactly and then retrieved also exactly you know. So, there is not changes in terms of whatever is stored and whatever is retrieved, but in, in the case of human memory uh, it could be very constructive process in the, in the sense that when we store some information and what we retrieve sometimes may not be the exact re replica of what we have stored. Now, sometimes in between we kind of process things according to uh, our environment, our identity, our motivation, we kind of delete something, add something and then we kind of retrieve something. So, so, so there can be lot of constructive processes involved in the memory system. So, it is not like exactly like photographs where the things are stored whatever is there and then exact replica of it retrieve later. So, in the human memory things could be more dynamic, more constructive processes because of uh, so many factors involved in the, in our system. So, more more of this constructive process we will be talking about when we talk about eyewitness memory a little uh, more in little bit more detail. Now, when we talk about emotions and its connection with the memory, emotion have been found to have a significant impact on memory. So, and they affect all the process of encoding, storage and retrieval. So, emotion can impact all the processes of uh, memory memory system encoding storage as well as retrieval. More generally if you if, if you talk a, as a general finding is that a, that emotion can impact memory in terms of that emotion enhances formation and intensity of memories. So, whenever we are under emotional under certain emotions or when the content is emotional it helps to encode the information in a much stronger way, formation of memory is enhanced and intensity of that memory is enhanced. So, it is kind of that it is stored in a much more uh, intense ways. So, that it is more it is remembered much better. So, in that sense it impacts the memory by enhancing the formation and intensity of memories. So, this effect is particularly robust and occurs even for events that are not inherently emotional, but occurs during the period of heightened emotion. So, the event whatever we kind of encode in the memory need not be emotional, but let us say I am in the state of some emotions. It could be anger, sadness, whatever. So, that present state of mind 
kind of could also influence how things are stored. However, in some extreme emotional cases where we have very intense emotions such as maybe traumatic events or something like that, this effect can break down in terms of because the intensity is so much that you are not able to process anything and people may occasionally forget events that happen during moments of extreme emotion such as extreme panic. So, this can happen in extreme cases, but otherwise in general most of the time emotion enhances the initial formation of memory why this happens we will be looking about looking at it now. But in extreme cases sometimes we forget because of whole mind is not able to process anything because of the intensity of the event like highly traumatic events. Now studies have consistently shown that emotional events and objects are more easily remembered than neutral ones. So that is what we have seen because it is more, more strongly and intensely encoded in the system when we kind of process something under emotions. Now, so as compared to neutral objects, whenever some objects are has some emotional aspects to it, any object that has some emotional aspect is remembered much more better way as compared to something very neutral where there is no emotional content to it. For example, witnessing a bicycle accident leads to better recall of that event compared to a mundane event involving a bicycle. So, for example, if you if you look at let us say normal bicycle somebody is you know riding bicycles. So, we may encounter a lot of such incidents every day, but we may not recall most of these incidents, incidences associated with riding bicycle. But let us say you suddenly encounter an accident of bicycle associated with a bicycle. You are more we are more likely to remember that even for a long time because accidents are associated with emotions. So, because that event has emotional content to it. So, we are more likely to pay attention and remember it much more for longer time. Studies on word memory have found experimental studies where um, you know, people are given some list of words to remember. So, those kind of studies showed that emotionally charged words, emotionally charged words are better remembered than the neutral words and are often recalled more vividly or more clearly. So, if when list of words are given to remember let us say in an experimental setting, uh, people are you know, shown a list of words one by one brief for a very brief period of time and then later they are asked to recall what are the words that were presented to you. People are more likely to remember words that are some that have some emotional content to it or some em emotions are associated with those words as compared to words which are very neutral. For example, if you consider the word that are uh, shown here, uh, like one is detached, ugly, indifferent, evil, skeptical, romantic and so on. You can see some of these words have some emotions associated with such as those words, those words which are shown in red color like ugly could evoke some emotion, evil can also evoke some emotion, romantic can also evoke some emotion. So, when as compared to these black words are mostly neutral word like detached, indifferent, skeptical. So, when such words are presented people generally tend to remember this emotional words much better and they tend to they may forget the neutral words much more. So, remembering of emotional words are generally much better most of the research shows. Research has also shown that emotionally charged pictures uh, are also remembered better than neutral ones. So, whenever we see some pictures or whatever no, uh, or some uh, any kind of pictures where which can evoke some emotions we remember it much bet better way as compared to any picture which is neutral. Uh, even when presented very quickly with divided attention to prevent rehearsal, even uh, when these pictures are presented very, very quickly hardly you can even see them even then also emotional pictures are remembered much better ways. For example, if you see these two pictures, obviously this picture is more likely to be remembered simply because it evokes some emotions. A soldier is saying goodbye to his daughter, let us say. So, 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 this picture evokes a lot of emotions and we are more likely to remember it as compared to a picture of just a neutral picture of a tree or something like this. Now, why this happens? One of the ways we can explain why emotional contents or any content or any kind of 
words or pictures or whatever any stimulus from the environment which has some emotional content are remembered better one of the reason could be kind of explained through physiological arousal which are associated with emotions so this reasons for em enhanced memory for emotional uh, arousing pictures can be also attributed to the emotional content it is not just about that these pictures are un unusual it is not about the unusualness but the emotional content which kind of makes us remember more and why this emotional content because this emotional emotions are associated with physiological arousal our physiology gets activated uh, so kind of whole system gets triggered towards something whenever there is an emotion so everything pays more attention to it so the physiological research suggests that emotion has a significant impact on memory formation as heightened physiological arousal during emotion experiences can enhance memory encoding so this physiological arousal which are associated with emotions actually uh, leads to enhanced memory encoding so because of that physiological arousal we are more likely to encode the informations in a much better way or in a much stronger way so that that is one of the possible mechanisms and some of the evidences we will see here uh, this suggests that level of physiological arousal may be manipulated so uh, many experiments were done where they tried to change the physiological arousal and that they tried to see whether this change in the physio physiological arousal has an impact on uh, memory formation for example people try to do like increase release of hormones such as epinephrine or adrenaline and cortisol from the adrenal gland triggers by the emotional arousal. So, mostly whenever we feel stressed or emotional, particularly the negative emotions such as anxiety and stress, generally these hormones are released called epinephrine, which is also called adrenaline and cortisol from the adrenal gland. And research has shown that when this, these hormones are injected in the system of a human body artificially, epinephrine and cortisol they enhances memory of an event that was just experienced in both humans and laboratory animals. So, in both animal studies and human studies shows that when these stress hormones epinephrine and cortisol which leads to physiological arousal people become highly activated heart rate increases and so on when these are injected in the system uh, whatever work or memory work that is given generally they tend to perform better after injection of these hormones which leads to physiological arousal. So, this also kind of uh, provides some evidence that uh, here in this case without kind of uh, this uh, indirectly physiological arousal was created to artificially using hormones. So, this happens naturally under emo emotional influences. So, this whole emotions uh, physiological arousal happens and consequently uh, it leads to better formation of memory. The vagus nerve, one of the important nerve is stimulated by these hormones like epinephrine and cortisol which are associated with most of the emotional experiences which then excites amygdala which we have discussed in the physiological chapter, chap, uh, the lecture where we have discussed the physiology of emotion and amygdala was found to be very strongly associated with emotional experiences, it is a small organ in the brain and in the limbic system. it primarily you know gets activated when we experience emotions particularly fear and other kind of emotions or anxiety. So, basically this vagus nerves kind of stimulates uh, amygdala. Memory storage is also strengthened by direct stimulation of the vagus nerve or amygdala in the laboratory animals. So, memory also was found to be a, associated with the better formation of memory with the stimulation of this vagus nerve which is basically connected to amygdala in la laboratory animals. Now, even mild stressful events that do not last long can improve memory if they trigger our stress response. So, even when we experience some stress, so this is this is in general, there can be specific aspects of memory which may not function properly under stress that we will be looking at later. But in general, uh, under stress some uh, in certain aspects whatever we are giving attention to. Uh, memory of those aspects can be improved even under stressful conditions simply because under stress uh, this kind of hormones are released which enhances physiological arousal and uh, 
which ultimately leads to better formation of memories. Now, several studies that used uh, MRI, fMRI, uh, which detects changes in the blood flow in the brain, have shown that amygdala is more active when individuals are presented with emotionally intense images as compared to neutral ones. And these evidences we have already looked in the uh, lecture where we have discussed physiological aspect of emotions. This study is very clearly demonstrate that the level of amygdala activation is positively correlated with the accu accuracy of participant later recollection of the images. So, this level of activation of amygdala was directly correlated with the memory, memory performance, accuracy of the participants recollection of images that were shown. So, that means this also clearly shows that emotions under emotional impact the memory uh, could be enhanced, memory generally get enhanced, more general aspects of memory get en enhanced. People who have amygdala damage can still, if, if it is damaged still they can obviously have memories, create memories, but then it is no longer influenced by emotions because the amygdala mediates emotional experience. So, when we get intense emotions that ultimately influences memory formation. If amygdala is damaged then this whole process mediation process will not be there, but they can still form memories because memory has many other aspects to it. Amygdala is not the only thing, amygdala only mediates the emotional reaction which kind of enhances some memory formation which are emotionally associated. Now, research also shows there can be differences in terms of memories of positive and negative events. So, positive and negative events when we are talking about, we are talking in terms of emotional tone. So, some studies have shown that people tend to remember negative information more easily than positive information. So, in generally most lot of research shows that we are more likely to remember negative information or any stimulus which has some negative connotation as compared to informations which are positive in terms of evokes positive emotions. Now, this could be explained using uh, many uh, kind of uh, explanations. One is obviously the evolutionary perspective which says negative events which we kind of also explained in other lectures also that negative events or stimulus uh, whenever we experience in response to them negative emotions, uh, they have survival importance. So, that is why our whole attention or whole our resources actually goes there. Uh, more, more attention is kind of automatically allocated to negative aspects or negative stimulus or event uh, because of the survival value. Because if something is negative, it can be dangerous to us. So, we need to pay attention to it. So, this is how our whole biology is evolved like that. As compared to uh, the positive ones where there is no immediate survival danger positive is more related to kind of luxury that we experience, it has no direct survival importance. So, that is one of the evolutionary explanation that can be given to why negative events are remembered more because of their survival value. Negative stimuli usually elicit higher physiological arousal. So, another way obviously, apart from this evolutionary explanation, negative stimuli usually elicits higher physiological arousal. So, whenever we see some negative stimuli, our arousal or physiological activation gets much more strongly activated as compared to positive stimuli. Again, this could be also connected to survival aspects. So, whenever we are fearful or angry, the whole body gets activated in terms of um, energy, in terms of, in terms of heartbeats, sweating and so on. So, therefore, the improved memory for uh, negative events can be due to the level of arousal they generate rather than the just negativity of it. So, just negativity may not be the main thing, but the physiological arousals that are associated with negative events could be more could be more important in terms of explaining why they are remembered better. So, high arousal informations are generally better recalled than low arousal information. So, this is some of the general findings because of the allocation of high more attention. So, whatever we attend give more attention obviously, we are more likely to remember them better. Now, let us talk about mood congruent memory. In the last lecture, we talked about mood congruent kind of a, as a general phenomena, uh, mood congruence in terms of emo general emotions. That mood congruence is a general phenomena where your current emotional state can as kind influence the diverse cognitive aspects. 
here we will specifically talk about how this mode congruence impacts your memory impacts our memory functioning so this is the similar to that what mode congruence memory means what uh, we are more likely to remember so whatever current emotional state we are experiencing we are more likely to remember congruent information from the past so if you are happy now you are more likely to remember happy incidents from the past and the vice versa whatever for example if you are sad now you are more likely to remember sad information from the past simply because your present emotion kind of triggers congruent information from the past so that is called mood congruent memory so if we try to recall events from the past few weeks of your life uh, we are more likely to remember events that match with the emotional toll of the current mood so if you are happy more likely to remember happy events if you are sad we are more likely to remember sad events so this is something we generally are evident in our daily life experiences also so this mood congruent memory occurs when we tend to retrieve memories that correspond with the current mood so whatever information that we are likely to remember they are they are they are generally correspondent with the current emotional mood so they are congruent similar in in line in sync with current emotional state so this mood congruent memory occurs because an individual emotional state triggers so the present emotional state triggers the corresponding emotional node in the memory so this word node is coming from this whole associative network model that we have discussed in the last class of bowers model where it says that emotions and memories are kind of connected to each other in associative networks so whenever we are in the in a state of emotion such as happy or sad so this emotion emotional state can trigger corresponding emotions similar emotions that we experience in the past and all the events associated with that emotions so let's say so that is what is called corresponding emotional node in the memory it will activate the present emotional state and this activation spreads through the network bringing to mind memories that are associated with the emotions so it is like this whole thing spreads from the present emotional state so if you are happy this happiness will trigger the happy nodes happy emotion that we have experienced in the past let's say you did party in the last week so that it will trigger that emotion and the event associated with that emotions and whatever the memory is associated with that party whether you are eating you know talking to friends and so on so all these memories will get triggered by the present emotional state so this is this can be explained through associative network model uh, why this mood congruent memory happens so this mood congruent memory has been observed um, through various methods of inducing emotional state it has been found when it was induced using music hypnosis guided recall of personal events some ordered some smells or some naturally occurring states in every aspects this kind of mood congruent memory has been found to be kind of valid in all these contexts for example uh, we'll just discuss one study that was uh, done in 1995 by halbert stead and colleagues so here what happened uh, the condition was the participants were put into different emotional state so kind of artificially emotional states were induced to the participant using music so music was the kind of uh, kind of uh, the music was used to induce different emotional state and what happened so music can kind of induce happy happy emotional state sad emotional state depending on the kind of music now what they did they used homophones homophones basically these are pair of all kind of words which sound similar but the meanings could be very different okay similar sounding words but the meanings are different are called homophones so they used homophones with emotional so so this same pronunciation of two words one is but one word is emotional meaning is there and another word is neutral word for example word like morning so when it is used m o u r n i n g morning it means it is associated with sadness or some sad event and the neutral corresponding word is morning which is m o r n i n g morning which is uh, whatever no morning every morning that we experience it's a neutral word so similar homophones were presented to them after inducing different emotional state to different particip to participants 
and the meanings of this were read to them okay and they were asked to write down the word the spelling of the word would reveal which meaning the participant had retrieved from the memory so this is the condition that was kind of put in the experimental condition this was the experimental condition so different emotional states were induced and then homophones with one emotional meaning and one word with a neutral meaning were read to them and they were asked to write down the word so they were just read these two words uh, which could have different meaning one emotional one neutral and uh, they were asked to write so they were trying to see which word they kind of write out of this whether emotional one they write or the neutral one the result shows that the participants current emotional state influence the meaning of the words they recalled so those who are induced emotional state let's say sad emotional state they are more likely to remember m o u r n i n g morning word so which is connected to sadness so sad participants were more likely to write down the word morning while happy participants were more likely to write m o r n i n g morning so their present emotional stress which was artificially induced also influenced which word they remember in their memory so this is an example of more congruent memory through this experiment similar studies were also uh, performed later and showed similar findings so this was the different kind of uh, homophones were used in this experiment in all these pairs of homophones they have sound similar but one is emotional word and one is neutral word so these are like bridal bridal dear dear heel heel and so on like this so research shows corresponding emotion whatever emotion they were experiencing accordingly they were more likely to write the word which has emotional meaning corresponding emotional meaning sometimes people because of this mood congruence people can remember false information which are not actually there so this is called as mood congruent false memory it basically means when individuals emotional state influences their memory retrieval they may recall events that never happened but are consistent with their emotional state sometimes they can recall things which are not at all actually there but it is because of the present emotional state they recall something which was not at all there so this is called false memory but it is mood congruent false memory it is the mood that is inducing some retrieval of some informations which were actually not there so that is called as a mood congruent false memory here people are more likely to falsely remember information uh, that is congruent with their emotional state that was never actually experienced in real life for example let's say somebody whose name is john is currently in a depressed mood so the current emotional state is depression or sadness then he under this state when he recalls one party or gathering that he attended and he in the present state he might recall this party was very less enjoyable than what it actually experienced he, he might remember that this was not at all enjoyable uh, party or at least the intensity of whatever enjoyment he had experienced will be much less because he is presently experiencing depressed mode he may remember uh, his friends as distant and disinterested that people were not interested or not talking to him or whatever it is he will find some evidences which could be kind of exaggerated even though they were engaging and supportive during the event actually when they were engaging so this could happen with most all of us also sometimes because in the present emotional state we filter information and sometimes we add something extra to this information falsely just to be in congruent with the present emotional state so if you are depressed so you will filter information in such a way that it kind of corresponds with the sadness and the depression so whatever even something was good you enjoyed it but you will find it less enjoyable from the present perspective and you will find evidences that you know it was not interesting even though things were not like that actually so that is called as a mood congruent false memory sometimes we kind of add information in such a way that it is congruent with our present emotional mood but the reality could be actually different so we filter information because of our emotional state so we'll see more of this in the eyewitness where it, how it impacts now this another thing that happens so mood congruent memory can happen 
the another thing that happen happen is mode state dependent memory. Now, the difference there is a subtle difference here in a sense it is a state dependent memory mode state dependent memory not just general state, but what is the state of mode and how the information that we kind of learn or recall is dependent on the mode state. So, here what happens mood state dependent memory is the phenomena in which information is better retrieved if the emotional state during recall matches the emotional state during encoding. So, whatever emotional state you were during encoding or learning a particular content, you are more likely to remember that event when retrie during retrieval time the same, em same emotion is experienced. So, here the focus is what emotion was there during remembering that event. So, whatever emotion, so if other emotional experiences in the present time or something it is correspond with that during encoding, then you are more likely to remember that event. So, it dip encoding depends on that state of memory or state of psycho or emotion. So, the content of the information does not necessarily be emotionally charged. You can learn anything not necessarily the emotional events or emotional events or emotionally charged material, whatever you learn, but you are under certain emotions that when you learned it. So, in the next when you are in that emotional state again, you are more likely to remember those events. So, here focus given on who, what is the emotional state during learning that will kind of trigger the same material to come in the memory when you experience similar emotions whatever you learn need not be emotional content, you could learn anything neutral. In the mood congruence, your present emotional state according to the emotions the contents are coming and mostly the whatever you remember will be emotional because if you are happy you are more likely to remember happy events. Now, in mood state dependent memory, you learn something which may not be emotional whatever you learned in a certain emotional state, you are more likely to remember those things when similar emotions are experienced later. So, that is the difference for is, for instance, if someone is in a positive mood while studying for a test, they are more likely to remember the material they are also in when they are also in a positive mood during the exam. So, let us say they learned something in a positive emotional state, they are very happy when they learned something. So, if in the examination also if they are in the positive state, they are more likely to remember the event or remember the material that they learned. So, this is called as mood state dependent memory. In the mood congruent memory, you just tend to recall more of emotion material which are congruent to present emotion. If you are happy, you are more likely to remember happy things. So, present emotional state triggers something from the past uh, which are congruent with that. The contents are generally emotional. Here, content could be anything. It depends on only what emotional state you encoded. So, you are more likely to remember those information when similar emotions are experienced later. So, so that is the difference. So, in a mood state dependent memory, the emotional state in which something is learned or experienced becomes encoded in the memory along with the information. So, whatever you learn, your emotional state is also encoded. So, that is why later similar emotion triggers those learning again. So, later on when the same emotional state is experienced again, the mood state can act as a cue to retrieve. This mood state can activate those same emotional node in the memory and whatever you learn during that emotional state. So, this associative network model can easily explain this just I have kind of explained it how this can work as the emotional node in memory becomes activated when a particular mood is experienced. So, similar moods are also kind of activated in the past and along with whatever we have learned in that state emotional state. So, therefore, memories that have been encoded in a specific emotional state becomes more accessible during the same emotional state compared to a different ones. So, this mood state dependent memory is likely to occur in a free recall task as compared to recognition task. So, free recall task is basically when a list of things are shown to you and after some time some distraction task is given and then you are asked to remember what are the least, what are the what are the items in that list. So, that is called as a kind of <coughs> free recall task. So, let us say I give you a list of words which could include something like orange, it could mean something like soap, 
it could mean something like you know whatever cycle etc like this i give you a list of word and then for some time give some distraction or some 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 task just to not to re rehearse it again and then i tell you to recall let's say 10 items i gave you recall the items so that is called free recall whatever was presented you are freely need to recall what are the items in the list so that is called free recall in recognition let's say i will show you these items for short period of time and then some distraction task will be given and then after that i will give three four words like i will give orange then i can give something like bus and then i can give something like you know road so i'll i'll ask you to recognize one word which was there in the list that was presented so here that word will be given along with some other words which were not there then you have to recognize which one is correct so that is called recognition task so generally this mood state dependent memory is more likely to occur in free recall when you are freely recalling then that mood state becomes a cue to remember those things in recognition because already that cue is given in the word itself uh, then mood may not influence much so recognition tasks provide already cues for retrieval of information like if the list will have that word itself so people use their mood state as retrieval cues very little in contrast the free recall task participants are asked to generate previously learned items without any other cues provided so then mood becomes a cue and it helps to recall those whatever items so if you see just i just made a tabular kind of comparison between mood congruent memory and mood state dependent memory how they are different so in mood congruent memory we tend to retrieve memories corresponding to the current mood so current mood is important in mood congruent memory whatever mood you are in according you will likely to remember things from the past so if you are happy happy things will come to your memory so current mood is important in the mood congruent memory in the mood state dependent memory uh, here information is better retrieved if emotional state during recall matches the emotional state during encoding so while learning what was the emotional state at that time is more important so while learning under what emotional state you learned something so if corresponding emotion you are experiencing so you are more likely to remember them so la during learning what emotional state is kind of more important in this case here the content of information is generally emotionally charged so if you are happy you are more likely to remember happy events so events are contents are emotional here content need not be emotional so under you may be happy but you are learning something maths or physics or something which are which has no emotional content so you are more likely to remember those content also so the the contents need not be emotionally charged so for example if you are currently feeling sad you are more likely to recall sad memories here if someone is in a positive mood while studying for a test they are more likely to remember the material when they are also in the same mood later so the focus is different here they emphasize the impact of the current emotional state on memory here focuses the emotional state at the time of encoding as the primary influencer so that's the focus is different while you learn what was the emotional state that will trigger here what is your present emotional state that will trigger the past thing so the emphasis are different different in both cases emotions are playing role in terms of memory so emotion can play <coughs> significant role in memory processes uh we tend to remember emotional information better than neutral information that we have seen a general finding we tend to remember emotional information much better than neutral ones we have kind of seen the evidences we also emotions such as sadness are more likely to be triggered trigger the recall of other sad memories so for that is mood congruent memories so if you experience some emotion so their similar emotional content will be remembered emotional state also act as a mental framework for memory meaning that memories formed during a particular emotional state can be more easily retrieved during a similar emotional state so the retrieval of emotion could also depends on in what emotional state it was encoded so encoded emotion and retrieval emotion if they correspond with each other so 
So, these are some of the important kind of summarized from what we have kind of discussed till now. Now, the last one that we will be talking about is called eyewitness memory, uh, where emotion can also play a very important role. Now, eyewitness memory basically whole the concepts can be explained using the concept of reconstructive nature of memory or constructive nature of memory that we kind of um, kind of hinted in the first slide that memory is not just exact replica like what camera does that it takes a photograph and exactly we can see it later or memory is much more dynamic. So, that is the idea of reconstructive nature of memory and the, this concept was first proposed by Bartlett in 1932. He proposed that memory is not a passive recording device, but an active constructive process. When individual remember an event, they do not retrieve a perfect replica of the event. When we recall something, some event, we do not exactly recall what was there in the actuality. We kind of reconstruct it based on our current knowledge, experiences and cultural norms. What I f So, we can add delete based on whatever I think was there according to whatever my personal beliefs or cultural norms. So, something will be added deleted. So, that is whole thing is called reconstruction process. So, this Bartlett research showed that as people recall past events, they often change or omit details. They do not fit with their mental framework. So, jo, whatever is there is does not fit with their mental framework or their belief system, they will delete it and add something to just fit with their mental framework. This process can lead to memory distortion. So, memory can be distorted, not exact replica or whatever exactly happened may not be reported, where people inadvertently alter their recollection of over time. With the passage of time, people change the whole thing that they have seen. So, that is called reconstructive nature of memory. Now, if memory can is changed reconstructive nature of memory, then obviously emotion can play a role, role and particularly in the context of eyewitness memory, when you see, see an event and then become a witness in the court or it could be in any other context. Suppose you witness a crime, how would you re recollection of the incident be impacted? So, people have been trying to see when people see some crime. And then they become witness in the court or something like that. Do are they able to kind of recall the events clearly or exactly, or are there any errors in their kind of uh, recall of the events? Eyewitness memory basically is talking about that. Is an individual's recall of an observed criminal incident or other significant and dramatic event they have witnessed. So eyewitness memories typically deals with when people become a witness to some criminal event or a dramatic event and then they later had to recall it to somebody because of that, in, that that incident has to be verified. It could be in the court or it could be in some other context. So, that is called eyewitness memory. When you witness something, some dramatic event, criminal event, then you report it. When you report it, are people accurately report it, whether they record, report it accurately or they kind of uh, kind of make changes in that. So, psychologists generally discovered, uh, especially the Loftus, uh, she is one of the prominent researcher in eyewitness memory. They found generally, typically most of the time eyewitness memory can be erroneous. People generally report a lot of things which are not correct in the witnessing when they witness something. So, that is what is general finding, we will see how some, the, some of this conclusion came up. So, just because someone is confident in saying something does not mean that it is accurate. It con this confidence could be simply because that person believes it is right, but actually that may not be true. In the Devlin report in 1976, UK government basically is a committee set up to investigate instances of wrongful conviction in the UK. When conviction was done wrongfully, so a committee was formed to look into that. And they concluded that it is not dependable to convict an individual solely based on just eyewitness testimony. Whoever has just witnessed it, just based on that convicting somebody may lead to wrongful conviction. Unless there are exceptional circumstances or supporting evidence for some other type. So, if, uh, if, if the evidences are obviously exceptional, then it can be done. But otherwise, uh, most of the time it may not be correct to depend only on the eyewitness testimony. So, this eyewitness memory uh, is can be under the influence of misinformation effect. So, if I give some misinformations, the person recall is also influenced. 
he may re recall something which was not there. So that is called misinformation effect. So that lot of lawyers use this. The, they will ask a particular kind of question and the change the answer of the uh, witness. Simply they will recall something which was not there or something like that. This is how people also manipulate this whole thing. So cognitive psychologist Elizabeth Loftus has conducted a kind of uh, extensive research on memory, particularly in the eyewitness memory, false memories in this context related to childhood sexual abuse and so on. So, a lot of these false memory things, eyewitness memory context, Elizabeth Loftus did a extensive research and a lot of these findings we will see. She is also known for developing misinformation effect paradigm in the eyewitness context, uh, which explores how exposure to incorrect information lead to individual misremembered things of, of the original event. When incorrect informations are given to people, they can misremember or recall something which was not there or recall something falsely. So, that is called misinformation paradigm and uh, we will see if one of the experiment that she did. So, according to Loftus, the individual's memory of an event can be highly flexible due to the influence of misinformation effect. So, what was the experiment? One of the classic experiment that Loftus did was uh, Loftus and Palmer conducted in 1974, which involved 45 US college students. So, it was a simple experiment. So, what was the condition in the experiment? Participants were shown films depicting car accident. So, that was a film shown where two car collided. So, there was an accident and were asked to assume role of witnesses. They were asked to see the event and, and they will be witness to describe what has happened. So, that was the simple thing that was there. So, different group of participants were questioned using. So, different groups were formed from this participant and they were questioned using varied form of a question. One question was asked to everybody, but the way question was asked was different. Same thing was asked, but some words were changed for different groups and they were trying to see how the changing of the words in the questioning itself can lead to uh, impact on the recall of the event. For instance, they were asked about how fast were the car going when, what was the speed of the car when they, they kind of collided means they use different words here. For some group they use the word smashed. So, what was the speed of the car when they smashed each other? That was the word used. For other participants they use the word collided with each other. For other participants they use the bump with each other. For other participants they word hit with each other and so for some other participants they use when this car contacted with each other. So, different verbs were used for different participants, but the question was same. They were asked what was the speed of the car, average, whatever lump sum speed they think was there. So, only the verb was different in the question, otherwise everything was same. So, that was the experiment. What was the result found? They found that the choice of verb in the question significantly influenced the participant estimate of the car. What was the car speed that kind of change from participant to participant depending on what was the verb used. Participant who were asked what was the speed of the car when they smashed with each other, this smashed word was used tended to provide higher speed estimate. So, these people estimated the highest speed as compared to when they were asked when they collide or kind of contacted each other, they estimated much low speed. So, thus two words were different same question, but their whole recall was different. So, this misinformation effect impacted their memory. So, what is the conclusion that was derived from this that this demonstrated that the implied information about the speed based on the verb used in the question had a notable impact on the participant memory of the accident. So, the memory may be changes based on what was asked. So, this is called misinformation effect. So, this was kind of uh, see film was shown, this is a static here, but they were shown film and then you can see what was this, when the smash word was used, uh, the estimation speed was highest as comp and the contacted when were used, the estimated speed was the lowest. So, they did a follow up experiment on this, the same participant after a week, after a week they did a follow up. Uh, where the participants were asked if they recalled seeing any broken glasses 
even though no one was depicted in the accident picture actually the picture and the, this whole video there was no picture which shows that pieces of uh, glasses were there but they were asked did you see any kind any broken pieces of glass in the incident it has found that participant who had been exposed to the smashed condition when when they asked the participant who were asked what was the speed of the car when they smashed with each other or the word smashed was used this group of participants were more likely than twice likely than other people falsely remember seeing broken glasses they reported they have seen broken glasses when actually it was not there simply because they estimated higher speed so if two car collide with each other with high speed there must be some broken glasses so that was an assumption so they falsely recall something which was not there so this what could be concluded this experiment illustrate that the leading question how the question is asked not only influence participant what they remember the car was traveling at a higher speed but also led them to falsely recall things which were not there so this could have a lot of implication for courts and the and the system of law and criminal justice and so on so where <coughs> eyewitness testimony can be erroneous and it can be changed using leading questions so numerous studies have supported this idea that even young adults who are commonly used in this research subject are susceptible to such kind of misinformation effect additionally research has shown that children and older adults are even more vulnerable children can their memory can be much more vulnerable and older people so this can be much more stronger effect of misinformation effect they can falsely remember a lot of things so they are the credibility could be much less so it's worth noting that a misinformation effect can occur unintentionally people actually don't intentionally say wrong things but it can happen unintentionally because they assume lot of things because memory can be reconstructive it's not an exact replica that we see and report lot of things happens how you believe what are your norms and so on accordingly we make changes without any intention to deceive so this can be purely without any intention people can falsely recall things people can uh, change the facts of the incidents and so on so eyewitness memory may for how 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 emotion could influence here because in eyewitness memory emotion is included automatically simply because you are witnessing a crime scene or a very extraordinary situation emotions are bound to happen there so basically emotion is by default there in the eyewitness memory so this failures and distortions are influenced by so many factors can influence primarily the emotional state of the witness could lead to such false kind of or errors in the recall of the event because whenever you are witnessing a crime or some kind of extraordinary event like accidents you are the witness is in a very strong emotional state so this can influence how they report it so generally and we people remain under stress and a high anxiety uh, during eye witness situation and stress can influence memory in certain ways one thing is that you know it can decrease encoding of information in general what we have discussed earlier that emotion can enhance memory means some specific aspects we are talking about but it can lead to decrease encoding for some other aspects we will see later so generally if something is emotional we remember that much better way as compared to that's a neutral one but when a situation is has lot of under stress you are kind of looking at a situation you may remember something better but you can also at the cost of not remembering other things so we'll see into that so it can lead to some decrease encoding of some information obviously one can remember something better but it can lead to decrease encoding of many other things in the situation stress also or anxiety narrows attention to specific stimuli so under stressful situation or emotional situation our attention become highly narrowed it becomes very concentrated on something so by default you will remember that obviously but it can lead to uh, forgetting other things so this is how we can explain so let us see very briefly about these two aspects so one is decrease encoding of gen information in general when we are under stress when individuals who are eyewitness undergo significant stress their memory capability is generally diminishes because their attention turns towards safeguarding their own safety now in the context of eyewitness it is not just general information general emotional situation the person's his or her own life is at risk 
So, when your own life is at risk, you are you will not be able to process all the information what is happening there because your focus will be to safeguard yourself. So, this is the situation is different from the general emotional situation. So, individual when they become eyewitness, they undergo significant stress because of which simply because their own life is at stake or others life are at stake. So, people may not encode or process all the information there simply because of too much of stress in terms of surviving the situation or uh, that can be life threatening. Studies have shown that witness of violent events tend to have greater levels of memory disruptions. So, memory can get disrupted because of if when we witness something violent. So, in that situation primarily because of your threat of your life, you may not be able to look at other things what is happening. So, many details you cannot kind of encode and process. In a meta analysis where a lot of studies in a particular area were analyzed together, uh, it was found that stress and eyewitness memory, uh, this was by Diffenbaker and colleagues in 2004 they did a meta analysis in this direction and they found that strong evidence of supporting that increased stress adversely affects the accuracy of eyewitness identification. When people are in a high stress in an eyewitness situation, their memory functioning or accuracy decreases drastically simply because in this situation the life is at stake and people experience very high stress and they are not able to encode all the information in the situation. Second thing that happens narrow, narrowing of attention in the under stress. So, when individuals act as an eyewitness or witness acts of violence, it triggers an increase of arousal causing their focus to narrow down to a limited amount of information typically source of uh, the source of the stress. So, they are, could only focus on very specific aspects in the environment. So, whole attention gets narrowed down and uh, especially during the eyewitness situation which in turn results in a decrease in the quantity of information that we can store. We can only report few things, but a lot of other things we are not able to process. So, quantity of information is decreased in terms of memorizing. The reduction in stored information occurs because of attention get fixed into only one th few things which are very dramatic in the situation. Other things we are not able to process. Uh, while less cognitive processing is allocated to other details. So, this is what happens when attention get narrows down. One aspect of narrowing of attention is called weapon focus effect. Weapon focus represent basically a distinct case of narrows attention where weapon itself serves as the focal point. So, especially when in a crime situation people have weapons, the whole focus goes in the weapon itself because this is the most significant in the whole environment. People be Whole because their whole life gets threatened because of the weapon itself. So, the whole attention goes to the weapon and when weapon is present, individual tend to allocate their attention, all the attention primarily to the weapon, diverting focus away from other environmental detail, details. As a result, this peripheral details may not be encoded accurately and in some cases, they may not be encoded at all. So, when a very strong significant weapon is there in a crime situation, whole attention goes to the weapon because this is this can lead to threat to life. Other things are generally peripheral things people generally forget or many times they are not able to even uh, remember anything around the around the incidents. So, this is called as a open focus effect which happens because of high stress in that eyewitness situation. Therefore, emotional recall often becomes at the expense of impaired recall of other non-emotional aspects. So, under emotions we can remember some things better, but in the context of eyewitness it is not just normal emotional situation or emotional content here life is at threat. So, people focus on only few central aspects and uh, which can be remembered obviously, but other things are generally not accurately remembered or not able to pro people are not able to process them. So, basically what happens in the eyewitness situation attention generally goes to the central information and peripheral details are generally neglected or no people are not able to process them which leads to a lot of errors in terms of reporting. So, it is possible that attention becomes concentrated on a very specific aspect of the event like weapon witness is more likely to retain memory of it that is central information is more likely to be remembered as compared to the peripheral. So, people are report able to report central things, but when peripheral things are asked people generally are not able to accurately report because they have not even processed them properly. 
So, typically the finding indicates that people tend to remember actions typically taken by individuals involved in the event, most of the important actions in the central aspects, while details related to how the appearance of the perpetrator and other peripheral details are generally forgotten. So, as our attention is very limited, remembering emotional events such as bicycle accident that we have discussed may result in excellent recall of only central features and uh, we are poor likely to poorly recall the peripheral features. Let us say like color of the car in the background, let us say something has happened, background may what was the color of the car and what how many people were there and so on, all these peripheral things generally get diminished in terms of remembering. Uh, so, re research has indicated that we have better memory for information related to the gist or general theme or central aspect of the events compared to the uh, details that are not related to the gist. So, that is why where a lot of errors happens in the eyewitness testimony. So, information related to the central theme is generally effectively integrated and more easily recalled. Uh, even peripheral information if they are associated with the gist or some central aspect can be remembered as compared to unrelated peripheral information. So, so with this we will stop here. So, these are some of the uh, kind of researches, some evidences which shows how emotion can influence our memory in so many ways. So, with this I will stop here. and. Uh, in the next lecture, we will be talking about how emotion impacts our judgment and decision making. Mm -hmm.